Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for helping to make it possible, at least plausible, for us to start on time this evening. We are waiting on only one guest, and he is our author and guest speaker. <laughs> He's on his way and should be here shortly, so we beg your indulgence and your patience, and we will start as soon as he arrives. I'd like to ask you please to take your seats in the meanwhile so that we can ascertain if there are any empty seats in the hall as there are many guests still waiting to be admitted. Thank you so much.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Liebe Geft. As the director of the Museum of Tolerance, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's distinguished author program, a special evening with Michael Oren, Israel's former ambassador to the United States and now a member of the Knesset and author of Ally, My Journey Across the American-Israeli Divide. The recently published book has already caused quite a stir. It has been described as a fascinating depiction of the cultural, personal, and historical ties that bind Israel and the United States together, even as the Israel-Palestinian conflict and the US policies towards the Iran nuclear program strained that relationship. Interweaving the story of Orin's personal journey with behind the scenes accounts of fateful meetings between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu, high stakes summit with the Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas and diplomatic crises that intensified the controversy surrounding the world's most contested strip of land. Ally is at once a ringside seat of some of the most significant political summits of our time, a compelling memoir and a timely testament to an alliance that was and will remain vital for Americans, Israelis, and the world. Michael B. Oren is an American-born Israeli historian, military officer, and author, and was Israel's ambassador to the United States from 2009 to 2013. He has written two New York Times bestsellers, Power, Faith, and Fantasy, America in the Middle East, 1776 to the present, and Six Days of War, 1967, and the Making of the Modern Middle East, which won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for History and the National Jewish Book Award. Throughout his illustrious career as a Middle East scholar, Dr. Oren has been a distinguished fellow at the Shalem Center in Jerusalem, a contributing editor to the New Republic, and a visiting professor at Harvard, Yale, and Georgetown. The foreword named Oren one of the five most influential American Jews, and the Jerusalem Post listed him as one of the world's 10 most influential Jews. <laughs> he currently lives with his family in Tel Aviv, and as noted, is a Haver Knesset. The author's presentation will be followed by what I'm sure will be a lively discussion, moderated by David Suisa, president of Tribe Media and the Jewish Journal, and will include some of your questions from the audience. Immediately afterwards, you are invited to purchase your copy of the book, which will be personally signed by the author. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Oren. Told, I was going to see just how tolerant you were <laughs> and how long I could be late. I'm running on standard Israel time here. Um, can you all hear me? Can you all see me up there? Because I can't see you. Anyway, I am delighted to be at the Museum of Tolerance. I'm delighted to be here with my dear friend and, and soul in arms, David Suisa. Uh, shalom, everybody. So this book is called Ally. Um, I wrote it in, in about a year, 400 pages long. It took off 50 days for last summer's war to defend Israel on television. You may have seen some of that. Um, and then when I finally finished it, more or less on time, for, uh, for Random House, I had to figure out what to call it. So you don't think about it, it's a title. It's, not, it's a non-trivial question. What do you call the book? I knew it had to be, it had to be two syllables, one word. Don't ask me how I knew this. Just had to figure two syllables, one word. And then one day, I was next to my wife, and I turned to her and I said, it's called Ally. And she said to me, so I'm going to look at this and say, it's Ali. <laughs> and I don't want to embarrass anybody, but this book has been introduced in various uh, forms around the country as Ali. Um, and then my wife's name is Sally, and she says, well, someone's going to say you forgot the S. <laughs> but Ally it was. Ally, Ally is one of the most beautiful words in English. Think about it. The, you, you, it always has a positive connotation. You can be a partner in crime, but never an ally in crime. And in Hebrew also, ally is one of the most beautiful terms in Hebrew. Ben Brit. Ben Brit. That evokes the special relationship between the Jewish people and God. 
The United States and Israel are special in their alliance. They have a special relationship. I know of no other country in the world, including Britain, including France, Italy, no other country in the world that has all at once a deep spiritual connection between them. And this is a very religious country. More people go to church here than any other industrialized Western country per week. And I can't tell you how many times I would go into Congress and go into the office of some legislator from West Texas who's, can, who's district was five times the size of the state of Israel, probably didn't have a single Jew in that district, and he had the Bible opened up on his desk, opened the book of Genesis where it says, those who bless my people shall be blessed. And the congressman would point to that, he said, you see that, you see that? I believe in that. How much do you want for Iron Dome? <laughs> no kidding, More, many times. Who has that connection? We have uh, common democratic values, shared democratic values, and Israel, is part of that ever-shortening list of countries that are democratic in the world. It's not getting wider, it's getting shorter. And we are on the very, very short list of countries that have never known a second of non-democratic governance. Think about that. It's Great Britain, New Zealand, Canada, Australia. Not a second. And we are the only member of that elite club that has also never known a second of peace, which is qu quite extraordinary. We didn't have a strategic relationship with the United States until the 67 war. We fought that war with French arms, remember? French switch sides. And uh, it was only on the seventh day of that war that American policymakers woke up and said, whoa, there's this little superpower out in the Middle East, just defeated a couple of Soviet armed Arab forces. We should be aligned with that country. And thus was born the U.S.-Israel strategic relationship, which today it covers vast areas. I could spend an hour just talking about this. It's joint weapons development, anti-ballistic systems, intelligence sharing, special forces training, every area you can possibly imagine. You know that every American combat pilot, helicopter jet pilot wears an Israeli helmet. Amazing. So find me another set of countries in the world that the United States has this type of relationship that is spiritual, democratic, and strategic. Totally special. In many ways, we are one another's ultimate allies. And yet, the United States and Israel have divides. We are separated. We are separated on issues that go back to 1967, settlements, Judea, Samaria, the West Bank, the peace process. We're divided on issues that go back to 1948, the status of Jerusalem, very deep down. We're divided on issues of arms sales to the Arabs, which is quite extraordinary. You know, the United States gives us $4 billion a year in aid, Biden aid, and 75% of that aid is, is spent here in the United States. It creates tens of thousands of jobs, but the United States is also selling tens of billions of dollars to Arab countries. Now, also within the framework of this possible Iran deal of trying to compensate these Arab countries, who knows who's going to control those arms in five years from now? Look what just happened since 2011. The Middle East is completely unraveled. So it's an issue. We, are, we have these divides. And they sometimes can tear the entire fabric of the relationship asunder. We've seen it happen in the last couple of years. I won't go too deeply into my own biography, but, uh, or autobiography, as it were. But uh, I always thought of myself as a person who could span the divides. I grew up in this country. I grew up in New Jersey, other side. Someone here from New Jersey? You're supposed to have a clap at that point. Yay, yay. I always said I spent more time in my office defending the state of New Jersey than I did defending the state of Israel. <laughs> Senator Menendez didn't think that was funny. And, um, but I, I had a very typical American childhood. I was clumsy, dyslexic, fat, uh, failing out of school. Um, and, uh, but I, I had my dreams, and uh, I wanted to be a writer, which was pretty funny because I, I couldn't spell. Um, I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to uh, meet the girl of my dreams, which was pretty funny because I couldn't get a, a date to the junior prom. And, um, and I loved America. My father was a career officer in the U.S. military. He landed on Normandy Beach. He fought off the World War II. He's 90 years old, still going strong. Um, I loved America, I loved everything America stood for, I loved its ideals, but from the earliest age, I was deeply in love with the Jewish people and saw that someday uh, I would live in the state of Israel. I couldn't believe my luck that I was alive at a time in Jewish history when there existed a sovereign Jewish state, that I could live there, which was pretty funny because I also failed out of Hebrew school. <laughs> and I wanted to be an Israeli soldier, uh, which is funnier still because I couldn't run, imagine running with a gun. and. Um, but then when I was 15, I got my ultimate dream. My ultimate dream was when I uh, was in the Zionist youth movement, went to Washington, D.C. The book opens with this story. Um, 
and I got to shake the hand of Israel's ambassador to the United States. His name was Yitzhak Rabin. And I said to myself, ah, that's what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be the person who bridges these two gaps together. And in a very typical American way, I sort of lived out my dream. Um, I taught myself how to spell, became a writer, historian. I moved to Israel, taught myself Hebrew, uh, learned to run, learned to carry a gun, became a paratrooper, uh, met the girl of my dreams, who uh, Sally, who was actually too cool to go to the junior prom because she was busy playing frisbee with Jerry Garcia and read all about it. And then, um, and it, sometimes the dreams were nightmares. I, I, as a paratrooper, I participated in several wars. Uh, our eldest son was wounded in, in combat. Uh, Sally's sister was killed by a suicide bomber. A lot of, lot of, not all of, and then I actually got to work with Yitzhak Rabin. And then several months later, I attended Yitzhak Rabin's funeral. Uh, now, some of the dreams, but there was joy. We raised this wonderful family in Israel. And then in 2009, I fulfilled my final ultimate dream. I was named by the newly elected Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, as Israel's ambassador uh, to Washington. And um, thank you. And, but what a moment. Let's, let's, this is ancient history, 2009. America's in the, the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. Political polarization, war weariness from two wars in the Middle East. The entire Middle East is about to unravel. Syria and Egypt. Syria, Egypt would have one, one but two violent revolutions. Syria and Iraq would cease to exist. All this was going to happen on my watch. And right at this juncture, the Palestinians are walking away from the negotiating table. They had just turned down a full offer from Ehud Omer for a Palestinian state in almost the entire West Bank, all of Gaza, half of Jerusalem. And then Mahmoud Abbas refused to negotiate with us. And the Iranians are going from 6,000 centrifuges to 19,000 centrifuges, enough enriched uranium to make one bomb to make four bombs with underground fortified uh, installations. All this is happening, 2009 to 2011, all this is going on. And at this fateful juncture in history, you have two of the most mismatched leaders you could possibly imagine. Okay, you've got Benjamin Netanyahu, newly elected, and the newly elected 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. On one hand, Netanyahu, who was a former commander in Israel's Delta Force in Sayeret Matkal, um, had, was an economist, graduate of uh, MIT. Uh, had been 20 years in Israel's Knesset. He had been a successful foreign minister, section financial minister, finance minister. He had been a former prime minister. He had been the second in command at the Israeli embassy in Washington. He had been Israel's ambassador to the UN. Pretty intimidating resume. But uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was not particularly loved around the world, to say the least. Wasn't particularly loved in Israel either. And you compare it to Barack Obama in 2009, who doesn't have Netanyahu's experience in any of these areas, but he's an icon. He's a superstar. Uh, in America, certainly, but in the world, oh my God. Very, very different. And you have two men who have profoundly different worldviews. Uh, Netanyahu, you should know, hates political correctness. I don't know if you know this, David, he will not say the word paradigm. He hates the word paradigm. Um, uh, Netanyahu is sort of the anti-rock star, doesn't care. When he comes into office in 2009, the first thing he does is hang a big picture of Winston Churchill over his right shoulder, so we'll look over his shoulder. You like that. Barack Obama is political, political correctness incarnate. He is a rock star. And the first thing he does when he comes into office is to remove a bust of Winston Churchill from the open office. And basically, to me, that always says it all, the Winston Churchill thing. And, uh, but also a deep at variance in worldview. Uh, Obama, as the president's prerogative is, comes into office with a worldview. What does that worldview in include? Heavy emphasis on American cooperation with world organizations like the UN. Um, outreach to what Obama called the Muslim world. He uses the term, it's a very loaded term. Um, unprecedented American support for the Palestinians. A recoiling from military force and reconciling with Iran, right from the get go. And Obama comes to office and immediately discards two of the long-standing principles in the U.S. Israel relationship, no surprises and no daylight. And this, this was the brief I got in the first day of the job. You should know there were two principles, no, prizes, no surprises, no daylight. The problem is I never got to experience them because they were both jettisoned as soon as I got into office. What was no daylight means we can have our differences over settlements, Jerusalem. We can have the differences. We have to have them behind closed doors. Because we have them outside, our enemies will see that there's differences between us, and they'll, they'll take advantage of it in a way that impairs both of our interests. And no surprises means that if the United States is going to make a major pronouncement on foreign policy that impacts Israel's security, we're going to get a chance to look at that statement before it's given. That's what Bush did with Eric Sharon in 2002 on the roadmap. That was abandoned. From day one, 
daylight and surprises. I was with Netanyahu at his first meeting at the White House in May of 2009, the first of 12 meetings I participated in. And right away, the president surprised him by demanding a uh, settlement freeze, freeze in Jerusalem, by the way, which no prime minister can do. The prime minister has no more authority legally to freeze in Jerusalem than the president of the United States has to freeze building in Los Angeles. And not only were these demands surprised to Netanyahu, but uh, they're made very, very publicly, very openly. Total pressure on us, no pressure on the Palestinians. So surprise and daylight. Again, in um, May of 2011, this gets into sort of details, but the, the, I was assured on May 18th, 2011, that the, Prime Minister, that the President was going to give a major speech on the Arab Spring, and it would have no Israeli uh, Arab or Israeli Palestinian component. Next day, the President gives a speech. It's all about Israel and Palestine, and it changes 40 years of American policy. He says that the basis of negotiations should be the 67 borders with swaps. That sounds pretty pretty mundane, but the fact of them is the goal of creating a Palestinian state on the, base, on the basis of the 67 forces of swaps was always a Palestinian objective. It was never an American objective. And the President moved it. But he moved it not by just not telling us, but actually telling us something else. So there were surprises, and there were daylights on the peace process in a way that not only hurt our interests, actually hurt the Palestinians. The Palestinians lost trust. It was Mahmoud Abbas who had the famous line that Obama put him up a tree and kicked away the ladder. Uh, the tree was the settlement freeze. Uh, and Obama kicked away the ladder because Mahmoud Abbas could not be less Palestinian than the President of the United States. So the President is saying you got to freeze. Every, we can't have talks unless there's a freeze in Jerusalem. And Mahmoud Abbas says, you know, you build a, a, a balcony in Gilo, it's going to stop the, the peace process. So we had really difficult problems on the peace process. And even uh, John Kerry, in, um, in last April, when the, when, the, when the process collapsed, if you remember, he gave us he gave a, a, a he testified to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and said. The process collapsed because the Israelis built 700 units in a settlement, and the process went poof. Remember this? I spent 12 hours on Israeli television trying to find a translation for the word poof. <laughs> there is none. Um, and that is, um, and where were the 700 units we were going to build? Do you know? In Gilo. And no Israelis think of Gilo as a settlement. Nobody. Even on the left, they don't think of Gilo as a settlement. So it, it was an impossible demand. Now, does this mean that the President of the United States is anti-Israel? I've heard several terrible things said about him, and I want to, I don't know. I say again and again, no, he's not anti-Israel. He is in favor of a different type of Israel. It's not the Israel of the Likud. It's not the Israel of the settlers. He has this very romantic Israel, a romantic notion of a pre-1967 Israel, which he thinks was more liberal and more democratic. I assure you, Israel is vastly more liberal and democratic today than it was before 1967. But be it as may, that's his image of Israel. And there were times when we really needed him, and he, and he was there. Um, in December 2012, I was going into the Hanukkah party at the White House, and I get a call from the Prime Minister on my cell phone, and he's got a voice that uh, you don't want to hear. It's panic. Uh, a terrible fire has broken out in the Carmel Mountain Range. 26 people are killed. We have run out of retardant. That's that brown stuff they throw out of planes. We, we don't even have planes to throw it out. We don't have any extinguishing planes. He says, go to the President right now, and, uh, and get this stuff. Ask how we need help. So I said, fortunately, I'm right across the street from the White House. I'll walk in. I walk in, I run into Susan Scher, who's the first lady's chief of staff who went to high school with me. And in New Jersey, his father played tennis with my father. And um, I said, he can see the president immediately. Go see the president. I said, tell him the situation, Mr. President. Israel needs you. This fire is, is descending on Haifa. He turns to Reggie Love, the, uh, his right-hand man, and says, give Ambassador and everything Israel needs. We set up a an emergency room, uh, action room in the NSC, in the West Wing. We worked all through the night. The US military scrubbed warehouses throughout Western Europe to get us the retardant of America's 11 uh, extinguishing planes. We got eight. We even got commandos, these hot spots who parachute behind fires and put out fires. They, they left Boise, Idaho that night and went through Newark and arrived in Tel Aviv the next morning. It's amazing. So when we needed him, he was there. But that doesn't disguise the divides. And now we are at the most poignant and profound divide of all, and that is over the Iranian nuclear program. You know, the Random House wanted this book to come out in, in October. I said, you can't put it out in October. It's, it has to come out now, while the talks are on, before they sign this thing. Before they sign this thing. Random House says, no, this is when, this is when you put out summer books. This is when you put out Jaws. I said, OK, change the name of the book to Jews. We'll, 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 we'll So the book is rushed out. I apologize for some of the typos, but it had to come out now because the Iranian nuclear program is not one but three existential threats to Israel. It's a 
threat of a nuclear weapon, we're a one-bomb country, according to Mr. Rafsanjani, the former moderate president of, of Iran. Uh, it is, Iran is the world's largest state sponsor of terror. They get military mil nuclear capabilities, the terrorists get military nuclear capabilities. They won't need a bomb, they just need a ship container. And once Iran gets the bomb, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, everyone gets the bomb. We find ourselves inhabiting a profoundly uh, unstable nuclear neighborhood. That's, that's a risk for us. And then, in addition to that, we have, with the United States, div divides. Now, the United States is a big country. It's far away. It's not facing this existential threat from Iran right now. We are. Our margin for error with Iran is exactly, exactly zero. Exactly zero. I had the uh, privilege of participating in five years of intimate talk on the Iranian issue with the United States. And we sat around the table. We looked at the same data. We reached the same conclusions about the program. But we have difference of, co of concept. We have deep conceptual differences. The president has gone on record saying that the Iranian regime is rational. It's anti-Semitic, but it's rational. Umar has said this. It, uh, it operates on a cost-benefit analysis. It is uh, capable of being a responsible regional power. It can even bring about reconciliation between Sunnis and Shiites if properly engaged. We see Iran as an irredeemably irrational power, a medievalist jihadist cult that openly plans jihad against us and genocide against 8 million Israelis. And is working actively to do that around the world. It's trying to kill Israelis and Jews on, across five continents as we are speaking and upgrading its ability to do that. Again, we cannot take the risk with Iran. And uh, one of my, my, my principal goal in publishing this book now generally was to create a conversation between Americans and Israelis, between American Jews and Israelis around issues of trust and understanding which pertain to many far-ranging issues between us, and I know David is anxious and saying, cut it off, get up here already, um, to discuss this with me. But it all boils down at the end of the day to trust, to trust. In the summer of 2012, there was a bitter debate in Israel whether we should take preemptive action against Iran. And there were leaders of the, um, former uh, leaders of the Israeli uh, security and intelligence community who says, if we can't trust the President of the United States, who can we trust? Today, there is no conversation like that. Several weeks ago, the president went on Israeli television and said, um, we never really had a military option. And Israelis looked at each other and said, wait a minute, he said he's not bluffing. Is he bluffing? The question of trust, and the book is about trust, it's about love. This book comes from a very deep place. I basically have spent uh, most of my life writing this book. Yes, it took a year to write, but it really took uh, more than five decades to write. And it comes from a deep place of caring, Cave comes from a deep place of anxiety and a deep place of hope. It's a testament. It's a confession. It's a cry from the heart um, to reconcile, uh, to repair and strengthen relations between uh, the land of my birth and the land of my birthright, the land of my father to the land of my forefathers, all that. The United States has no substitute for Israel as its ally in the Middle East. We certainly have no substitute for the United States as our ally in the world, we are and will remain essential, not just for the security of the United States and Israel, not just for maintaining the last semblance of stability in the Middle East, but I firmly emphatically believe the U.S.-Israel alliance benefits all of humanity, all of us. Ally, thank you very much. David. Sally? Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Oren. Please take a seat and catch your breath for a moment. We hear your passion, your commitment, and your concern. I think it has invigorated the whole audience. It is my great pleasure now to invite the moderator of tonight's discussion on the book. David Suisa is president of the Me Tribe Media and the Jewish Journal, a popular weekly columnist who just won first prize for best editorial writing from the American Jewish Press Association. David was previously the founder and CEO of one of the largest advertising agencies in California, Suisa Miller, before selling the agency so he could dedicate himself full-time to the Jewish world. Please welcome our good friend, David Suisa.
I have to start with this question. Uh, a lot of people have asked me, said you better ask Michael, do you ever sleep? <laughs> I, I, I saw someone in Tel Aviv walking with a t-shirt the other day, which I, I, I really identified with. I'll sleep when, I, when I'm dead. <laughs> That's more or less it. Did you have any idea when you wrote this book that you would cause such a stir? Yes. Um, not, not necessarily from some of the quarters that I managed to stir, as you know. Um, we have a wonderful uh, fellow, we have, a, we have a common friend, Yossi Kalina Levy, a wonderful author. If you, if you haven't read, I should I hawk his book. Let's hawk his book, Like Dreamers. Like Dreamers. Um, and we were walking along, we were in Jerusalem about two, three weeks ago, and Yossi asked me, are you ready for this? Are you, you have any idea? Have you girded yourself for what's coming? And I said yes, but I think it's very abstract. Um, the attacks uh, on the book haven't been about the book, they've been about me. And I don't want to go through the litany of some of the things I've been called, but in a way it's encouraging, and in a, in a, maybe in a, in, a, in a type of counterintuitive, crazy Jewish way, um, it's encouraging because, um, because no one will take the book on its merits. It's easy to try to disparage me and try to delegitimize the book, and I, I certainly deal a lot with delegitimization of Israel in the world. Um, but no one has taken saying, hey, what you've written here isn't accurate. No one. And I would, I would strongly challenge them to try to do that. Uh, some people have said, well, you know, the United States surprised Israel in the past, or Israel surprised the United States in the past. We negotiated the Oslo Accords and we tried to negotiate with Hafez al-Assad in the 90s without telling the United States. You know this thing, not in the Gosnell Accords? I said, yeah, but those two examples are about six, seven years apart, and both of them are about issues that were in accord with American policy, making peace. In June of 2009, the president goes to Cairo. Remember this? Skips over Israel, gives a speech that's twice as long as the first inaugural address, gives a whole series of policy pronouncements from uh, unprecedented American support for, uh, for the Palestinian cause, settlement freeze, Jerusalem settlement, Jerusalem neighborhood freeze, reconciling with Iran's right to peaceful nuclear energy. This is a country that's trying to destroy this. All this was done without telling us. Without telling us. Now, tell me that that wasn't departure from policy. It was. Let's talk about daylight. Mm -hmm. I want to read you something I saw in the Washington Post. <clears throat> it's from uh, Philip Gordon. And he says, the problem with the book is that Oren's main argument is a caricature bolstered by exaggerations and distortions that would probably contribute to the deterioration of the very relationship the author purports to cherish. So regarding daylight, here's what he says. Let's just take a few examples. Dwight Eisenhower slammed Israel for the 1956 Suez operation and forced it into a humiliating retreat. Gerald Ford froze armed deliveries and announced the reassessment of the relationship as a way of pressing Israel to withdraw from the Sinai. Jimmy Carter clashed repeatedly with Prime Minister Begin before, during, and after the 1978 Camp David summit. Ronald Reagan denounced Israel's strike on the Al-Sirak nuclear reactor, blah, blah, blah. And he goes on with the loan guarantees for the first President Bush, and he has a whole litany of examples oh, yeah, that I seems to contradict the point you were making of the principle of no daylight. So what he gave was four, I could give those four or five similar examples. Find me many more. That's over the course of 50 years. I will give you 20 examples over the course of five years. And there's the difference. And, 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 and as I said before, I acknowledge there have been times when Israel has surprised the United States and the United States has surprised is Israel. There's been time when there have been daylights. What is but it? never as a matter of consistent policy. There is the difference. And I don't, one of the great advantages I have is sort of what would say a, a contemporary historian, and this is the first time I've ever written in the first person, friends. I, I, this is the first time I had to think about what voice I was as someone telling my own story, is that I don't really have to speculate about much of what the president thinks because he says what's on his mind. And the president made a statement uh, in January 2010 where he said expressly, I'm putting daylight between Israel and the United States and proceeded to do so. He had a reason, he said, when, when, when there's no daylight, the Israelis sit on the sideline, and, the, and that erodes our credibility with the, with the Arabs. I thought that, that was, was one wrong. Of, I thought that was one of the most important parts in the book. Oh, the daylight and, part. And if you, if, you, if you read the interview with Jeffrey Goldberg from a few days ago in The Atlantic, uh, Jeffrey takes on Michael on every point, except for that one. 
uh, when he makes the point that uh, when there is daylight, when, when there is no daylight, that Israel does not, he was making Obama's point. But the truth is that when there was no daylight with George Bush, we took more risks, and that's the point you were making. I haven't Always. seen anybody challenge that, have you? Because I, I think empirically it's very difficult to challenge it. When, when there was no daylight between George Bush and Arik Sharon and George Bush and Ehud Olmert, Israel withdrew from Gaza, a, a tremendously costly an and trauma, traumatic experience, and then Olmert offered a Palestinian state to Mahmoud Abbas. None of that has happened during, year, during these years when there has been daylight, because it's very simple, it's human nature. Two things happen. The Palestinians understand that they cannot insinuate themselves between us. Right? When there's daylights, the Palestinians don't even feel they have to negotiate. They can go to the UN. They don't need the United States. They, don't, they can get, from, get for free from the UN what they'd have to pay for in negotiations, which is Palestinian statehood. But beyond that, Israelis, we make concessions when we feel secure. This is something Richard Nixon understood. He was no lover of Zion. But he understood, we give, these, we give the Israelis weapons, we make them feel secure, they'll make concessions. And we proceeded to make concessions. We gave up a, a piece of territory that was four times the size of the state of Israel. Why do you think Obama didn't understand that? I don't know. I don't pretend to know. He had a worldview. I just, uh, and I could, I spend, a, I gave myself a course uh, called Obama 101, where I, some of you have read the book, where I uh, take all my historian's tools and, and set to work to try to understand who this person is, because certainly back in the, in the first, uh, first year of the first, administ first term in office, very few people knew who he was. We didn't know who he was. And I, I reached some conclusions, I think, which uh, uh, most of which have, have held to this day about how he would act in certain areas. What I do say is that the Palestinian issue is one of several Kishka issues. I hope that would catch on that issue. I want, I, want, I want to see journalists using this term. Kishka issue, uh, non-proliferation is a Kishka issue. Um, Iran is a Kishka issue. U.S. Muslim relations is a Kishka issue. Palestine is a Kishka issue. But what about America and Israel? Is that a Kishka issue? Not in the same way. It's not an issue that he's going to come back, that he feels that he has to correct and he has to resolve, and that's part of his legacy. His legacy is not going to be as a great uh, president who's, who, who is known as a great ally of Israel. He, he's a sufficient ally of Israel. How do you explain but this? But he's the president who's going to bring about a sea change mm. in, you know, in 30 years of basic uh, colder, hot war between the United States and Iran. And he, by the way, against the last point, David, it, the White House has said that the Iranian deal will be the, most, the single most important far accomplishment of the Obama presidency in foreign affairs, quote unquote. So so that, that's quite a, quite a statement. You have a deep understanding of America, American culture, the Jewish American culture that comes across in the book. How do you explain this deep attachment between so many American Jews and President Obama when it comes to Israel? But I don't think it's a zero-sum game. I don't think they are attached to Obama because of his position on Israel. Listen, I have a very big family in this country. Uh, you will read that I made Aliyah alone. I have no family in Israel other than the family I've made. And you know, I, I made Aliyah with a backpack. I left a lovely family behind. I'm still very close to them. They're here in California. They're on the West, East Coast. They're everywhere. In my entire family, I do not know anybody who voted Republican, in either in 2008 or 2012. And they care passionately about Israel. They care passionately about me and my family. But you ask them, okay, I ask them, what, what was your, what, what determined your vote? Overwhelmingly, they had the same answer. You know what it was? The composition of the Supreme Court. Someone's nodding out there. I can almost see. You know this. The composition of the Supreme Court. You saw it at work this week. Composition of the Supreme Court. Um, I've had, I quote one, uh, one conservative activist saying, American Jews are more pro-choice than they are pro-Israel. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but here's my, I, I would adduce my family as Exhibit A uh, of why American Jews voted for Obama. It's not simply because of Obama. I guess there was a tremendous amount of excitement in 2008. I, there were members of my family sleeping in, in Obama pajamas. I promised them I wouldn't mention them today. Very close members of my family. Um, but by 2012, people pretty much understood who, uh, what, who the president was and what he stood for, and they still voted for him because of composition of the Supreme Court. Right, but I'm talking about the pro-Israel contingent uh, Michael, in America, yes. people who <laughs> love Israel, Michael. Yes. People who love Israel. And, family and, loves and, Israel. And, and they love Israel, and, and they love Obama, and one of the things you hear over and over again, 
whether it's from Jeffrey Goldberg or Leon's Wiseltier and so forth, the reason it's the policy of Israel is the thing that divides them and divides them with Israel. It has nothing to do with the fear of anti-Semitism or anything personal against Netanyahu. I, I keep seeing this theme over and over again that it's the policies of Israel that they're against. Let's understand something. I, I don't want to create the impression that, that, that the president had a monopoly over making mistakes, even policy decision mistakes. We made mistakes. I made mistakes. We surprised uh, Vice President Biden when he came to Israel and we, someone, someone announced uh, a, a project in Ramat Shlomo, which is over the 67 lines. We surprised him again when Netanyahu met Biden in New Orleans There was another announcement in Jerusalem. Uh, Biden's staff loved this stuff. Um, but we apologized. Uh, in fact, I was next to Netanyahu when we heard about these projects. He was as surprised as Biden was. It wasn't a matter of policy. Uh, the only big policy decision that was a surprise, I don't think it was meant to be a surprise, was uh, Netanyahu's speech to Congress uh, last March, um, which I, as a, already in politics and not a member of the Prime Minister's party, I, I took exception to it. I did not accept, I did take exception to the content of the speech, not at all, 1,000% behind the content of the speech. I had questions about the venue. Uh, but generally, we tried to avoid surprises, and generally, we tried to avoid uh, daylight. Now, I don't know if that's the question you're asking. You're asking, is Certainly, we have policies that are not supported by a large share of the American Jewish population. I'm not going to say the majority, but a large segment are not um, are not particular are not are not great advocates of Israel's settlement. And they're policy. saying that's the reason they criticize Israel. It strictly has to do with policy. No. And then this is where the book gets very sensitive. I, I made a decision, Dave. I decided I was not going to shy away from anything. I probably had to have my head examined. I was going to touch the, the most sensitive chords. And I said, I mentioned the book took a year, uh, 50 days off of the war. Um, I don't know what that works out per page, but there's four or five pages of this book are dedicated to the US Israel, US Jewish Israel relation. And that, those four pages took me, took me a month to write because I agonized over them. They tormented me. I went back and wrote and rewrote trying to get the essence. So among the chords that I now see that I touched was um, American Jews don't understand Israel. I also say that Israeli Jews don't understand America. You go to an Israeli Jew and you say Selma, okay? They think you're talking about his cousin in Long Island, <laughs> right? Selma is a, a profoundly loaded term for American Jewry. It relates, it relates to the, maybe the, the pinnacle of the American Jewish experience when, when American Jews joined with African Americans fought for, and fought for civil rights. It means nothing for Israeli. How many American Jews understand what we've gone through in the last 15 years, withdrawing from southern Lebanon, withdrawing from Gaza, and being hit by thousands and thousands of rockets? Really what it means. When I'm writing this book, I've got to stop and run into a bomb shelter all the time. What does that mean? Can you internalize that? So I touched that, but then I went even deeper. I talked about American Jewish journalists. Oh my God, this, this was like, so I acknowledge an obvious fact. Jews are misrepresented in the American, oh, disproportionately represented in the uh, American Jewish media. Open up any newspaper, open up any op-ed page. It's a bunch of Jews yelling at each other. It's a mishpucha around a table. And, um, and you know, there's the old anti-Semitic canard that since the Jews control the media, the media is pro-Israel. Well, we may be misrepresented or disproportionately represented in the media, but that doesn't make the media pro-Israel. And, um, and in fact, there are American Jewish journalists who will say, oh, point the fact, I'm Jewish, therefore I can criticize the Jewish state. You know, if you all know people like this. I'm not gonna mention names. That has touched a chord, that has gotten people angry. I've been saying, it's been attributed to me mostly by Haaretz that I've called American Jewish journalists anti-Semitic. I mean, we're, this goes in all sorts of crazy places, but I'm stating a fact. It's a fact. Anybody want to challenge that fact? And, because you can't. It's, it's, it's irrefutable. And the fact that the American Jews are in the media, many of the media outlets are actually owned by Jews, sometimes for many generations, it hasn't made them pro-Israel. I don't expect them to be pro-Israel. I don't expect American Jewish journalists to be pro-Israel. That's also been imputed to me, that I expect American Jews, because they're American Jews, to write pro-Israel things. I don't expect them. I expect them to be journalists. What I do not expect them to do is to say, I'm Jewish, therefore I'm not those Jews. I'm different. And I think well, that's a legitimate claim. 
the rebuttal that I've heard and that I've seen is that their criticism is based on Israeli policy. It has, you know, they disagree with what Israel is doing and they have the right to criticize. In fact, speaking of that, my partner in crime, Rob Eshman, wrote a column uh, this week and it had to do with, uh, I have one question for Michael Oren, and that was, and that was his question. And he notices that in the book, you take on Obama, but you don't really take on Bibi. And one of the things that he finds missing in the book is that Bibi is always on the defensive, and at no point do you feel like he's taking the initiative. So I have two questions. One, do you agree with that assessment, that Bibi was mostly on the defensive? And two, did you have any moments, any sort of you know, intimate s moments with Prime Minister Netanyahu, where you challenged him. I almost wish I want, I want to be able to read, and I can't like, go look for it, but there's, there's, there's a section uh, here where I talk about identifying with the pain of American Jews who are, or are tormented by our settlement policy. I talk about, I understand, I understand it very, very well, and I'm, I'm, I think that maybe Rob missed, missed that part. It's a whole paragraph, and um, long for me. And, um, so I, 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 I'm going to have to disagree with him there. It's there in the book, and it was part of that four pages over which, at which I, uh, I racked my soul. Um, and then I talk about the mistakes that the Prime Minister made, but more than that, I talk about the policy debate that goes on behind the scenes um, in, to answer the question, how do we best cope with this phenomenon known as Barack Obama? So there's something different, something we have not known, certainly since in the middle Reagan years. It's also the problem with Phil Gordon's history, because things change. The Israeli U.S. US Israel alliance is, is, is not static. It, it's, it, it's very dynamic. And since the 85, all of his examples are before 85, notice, mm -hmm. P.S. Um, we have had no daylight and no surprises. And um, so the debate goes something like this. I say to the prime minister, I think we should adopt a policy of rope-a-dope. Remember those of us of a certain age who remember Muhammad Ali had this uh, plan of holding up his gloves in front of his face, take the punches, roll with the punches, but when we have to dig our heels in on an issue like Iran, we can dig our issues in, we, we can dig our heel in. But there were others around the prime minister who had a different idea. They, theirs, uh, their approach was more like Giuliani's broken window uh, theory, that if you don't, if you don't take a strong stand on the broken window, you're gonna get larger crime. So their feeling was if you didn't stick up to Obama on the small stuff, he would sort of steamroll you on the big stuff. And we had a genuine policy debate. Now sometimes I prevailed. Um, Netanyahu did, I don't take credit for this, but Netanyahu did become the first leader of Likud to embrace the two-state solution. He did become the first Israeli prime minister ever to effect a total freeze of building in the West Bank. And you were against that, but you went along with it. I was you, ambivalent you about it. Because it was I establishing a bad Don't precedent of having to sell I didn't presence. want to create a precedent. I was concerned that we create a precedent of paying the Palestinians to negotiate. Right. But I would also say, in the, I say that I was up against a choice, a difficult choice. Do we create a bad precedent with the Palestinians or would we get into a frontal collision with the President of the United States? But your so the moratorium for me was the right. lesser of two evils. Right. But I want to say that in the times when, when the Prime Minister took my advice and said, rope a dope, um, he didn't get a lot of credit for it uh, from the administration. Um, and uh, listen, I'll give you the, the worst example of all. September 2012, there was a tremendous amount of talk about whether Israel was going to, never was going to strike Iran preemptively. Tremendous tension, we're approaching the US presidential election. Will Israel strike Iran before the presidential election? An attempt to you know, make the president look bad. You remember this whole discussion. And I get called to the prime minister's house in Jerusalem, I fly there from Washington, and he's busy making a drawing as I walk on. I never forget this. Drawing of a bomb, a little fuse with a red line. And we sat and we did this speech, and it said, if Iran passes this line, I can tell you what the line is very technical, that would be a red line for us. He gives this speech in September, and we go back to the suite at the hotel. There's a call from the president waiting for him there. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. You've given me time and space to work out a negotiated agreement. Two years later, sources in the White House, and I can say this in this museum, two years later, 
sources in the White House are citing Netanyahu's bomb speech and calling him chicken shit. I spent 12 hours on Israeli television trying to find a translation for the word trick and shit into Hebrew. It doesn't work in Hebrew, it doesn't go together. But you talk about not getting credit for something. Right. You, you, we went out in line. So most of the book, here Rob is right. At the end of the day, we're a tiny country. The United States is a superpower. And most of the book deals with the question, how do we cope? What is the answer to this? What I found the most poignant thing in the book was how you had a near obsession with nurturing and maintaining the strong relationship with America. It was, uh, it was something that animated you fiercely. And you had some differences with the prime minister on that. You were more the rope-a-dope and he was more sort of uh, tough, I guess is the word. Um, and now what's happened in the past few weeks since the book came out, uh, this relationship that you value so much it seems that it's made things worse. Does that give you any sort of ambivalence or uh, any, how, how do you react to that? This relationship that you value so much and maybe the, the reaction to the book and especially to the three op-eds that were written. I think I, I, I certainly didn't make things better with Phil Gordon and Martin Indyk, but um, my indications of what I'm hearing from Washington are very different. That it's about time someone wrote this book. And I'm hearing this from an interesting quarters, um, and that um, that this book is giving people who have been uh, discomfited by the situation um, across the political spectrum, by the way, a, a chance to first of all re-engage with some of these crucial issues, to pull back from a certain brink, um, and uh, for those people who are very concerned about the the bad deal that is transpiring in in Europe, I, I'm not sure the Iranians are going to sign it. Um, it, it gives, it gives a, a more, it, it strengthens their position. Because I think if you read the book, the book is, is very nuanced, it's very balanced. I bet you, what you have inside it is all the criticism I've gotten from the right, because I'm too good to the president. I'm too good to Hillary Clinton. I get a lot of that every day. You should see my emails, what they look like. And, um, but how do you react to a legendary American Jew? Uh, maybe one of the top Jews in America, like Abe Foxman. Top Jew. <laughs> uh, who's really legendary. Wasn't that a film with Tom Cruise? Yeah. <laughs> so Ape Foxman, uh, you know, takes you on for these attacks and he asks you to walk back these unfair attacks that he calls that you said on Obama, uh, accuses you of, you know, borderline conspiracy uh, kind of discussion. I mean, how do you react when you see something like, not from an extremist, but from Ape Foxman? Does that hurt? Uh, yeah, but not in the way you'd think. Uh, um, I don't take it personally, uh, he imputed to me things that I, I not only did not say, I would never say. I never said that Obama abandoned, there's a quote from him, Obama, um, yeah. that Obama uh, well, that was embraced the, headline the Muslim writer. world to abandon Israel in the United States. Does that sound like something I'd say? Okay, what, what's sad to me is it has to do with the state of American Jewish leadership. And, um, you know, I grew up in a community, uh, the section on, on, on the Jewish community and, and, and Israel is called We Are One because I grew up in the period when UJA used to ra raise money under the logo, We Are One. Except in, in this book, it, We Are One has a question mark after it. And I address the question, can we still say We Are One? And one of the facets, one of the components of, uh, that enabled us in the 60s and the 70s to say We Are One is because we had leadership, and a very strong leadership um, that was recognized as sort of being a general uh, Jewish leadership. And, um, and that, is, that, is, that, has been, uh, that has been lost. I mean, you have some very great leadership in this institution, you really do, and they're national leaders, and I deeply appreciate them. And but at the Jewish Journal. Hmm? And at the Jewish Journal. And the Jewish yeah. Journal, yes, uh, we do. But we need that next generation of Jewish leaders. They're, I hate to tell you this, they're younger than we are. We need the Jewish leaders who are coming up who are in their 20s and 30s and are willing to, to, to do some very brave things. They're not easy times for anybody. And they're not, li they're not likely to get easier. So we need brave souls, spirited souls, people who are deeply rooted in their Jewish identity, who care about Jewish peoplehood, and, have, and operate out of a deep sense of Jewish morality. Uh, that's what we need. Now, one thing I noticed is the three op-eds you wrote uh, were 
I don't think they did justice to the book. The book was so nuanced and so deep and it was so rich. And I guess that's the nature of the beast when you only have 700 words. But when you uh, look back and you see that so much of the animosity and the vision and that happened regarding the book came from those three op-eds. And do you, if you had to do it again, would you do anything differently? Um, I'd probably make a, I, I, I'd probably try to influence some of the titles that were given to them, which I don't give them. You know, in op-ed writing, you don't get to give the titles. And uh, some of the titles that were given were not substantiated by what was in the op-ed. At the Jewish Journal, we would have yeah, worked you with done you that. on the but, headline. Uh, but I just, how about give the you one issue? op-ed. I actually say some of the, the things that, that, that the president has, has done, and, and I talk about abandoning principles but not abandoning Israel. It, 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 those nuances are lost. It's true with 700 words. You don't have much. And then the whole idea um, of the two Muslim fathers would seem to strike a... Which is, in the, by the way, the book is storm. four times tougher than those op-eds are. Four, uh, sorry, not four times tougher. Um, and I, the op-eds reflect. It's, it's letting my readers, it's signaling my readers that I'm, I'm about to publish a tough book. And, and brace yourself. And I'm not going to hold back on, on sensitive issues. I was taken aback by the whole thing about the Muslim fathers because that's, first of all, a, a standard question that anybody in my position would have to ask. What, to what degree did a policymaker's family connections influence his policies? And what was even stranger still was that the president talked about those family connections all the time. He wrote a book about them. Uh, I don't know why my mentioning them becomes so controversial. Moreover, I use the exact same methodology in analyzing Netanyahu. I talk about his relationship with his father. Right. Anybody who wants to understand me, understand my relationship with my what, father. So <laughs> right there. What I find fascinating, though, is that just a couple of months ago, you were one of the most beloved unifying Jews in America. Everywhere you went, everybody loved Michael Oren. Left, center, right. You had this incredible unifying force, and you've taken at great personal risk. Uh, you've written a book which has incredible candor. I've rarely read, read a book uh, uh, of the memoir genre that has such candor in it. And I, and I was always reading it, I was saying, this guy's not calculating what he's saying. I don't think he's really too worried about his career or his political future or, or burning bridges with anybody. I really just felt you were saying what was on your mind, and you're paying a price for it. Commit, committing suicide is what you're telling but me. No, but it, you're it, paying it, a it, price because it's so rare. If, if there was any American Jew, there was anybody in our community that you felt would not be attacked, it would be you. And yet, how does that feel? Does that hurt? How, does that, how do you react to that? I'm going to take the, the, Hillel, the Hillelian fifth, okay? Im enanimi mili, im iloak shave matai. But I'll put, a, I'll put a, a paraphrase on it. I wish you had a word for dafka in English. Uh, oi. Oi. <laughs> it's dafka because I was that unifying figure. It's dafka because I'm a moderate. It's dafka because I'm a member of a, of a, of a central, centrist party. I'm not a leftist, I'm not a rightist. It's Dafka because I understand America and Israel and love these two countries. It's Dafka because of all that that only I could have written this book. And I hope that doesn't sound too arrogant or egotistical, but I, I just can't figure it. It, it gives it, th this is not a time when Israel's survival is at stake. This is the, not about the time to think about how many people love me, okay? Um, so what you're saying is when the, when the stakes are so incredibly high, it's not the time to think about political correctness or about etiquette. And yet, at the same time, there was a clear moment, and I was in Washington when Prime Minister Netanyahu made that famous speech in Congress, where he could have used the exact same argument you're using now. Could have. Where he, he, and in fact, he did. And the stakes are so high that I realize I'm ruffling a lot of feathers, including at the White House, but the stakes are so high that I have to do it. And yet, you still were against the speech. I was, but for very tactical political reasons. I didn't know whether it, it would force those who were against the, tr the treaty, the bad deal, to rally around the president. That it was a purely diplomatic notion. It's the president's, it's the prime minister's right and duty to say what he did there, say what he did. It could have been, you know, there, there, there are aspects of it that could have been handled better, certainly. Um, Let's talk about Iran. But Go ahead. again, I want just the last point about this. About um, I'm going to put a very fine point on this, and I, I, uh, I urge you to accept my my 
earnestness in saying it is that if I hadn't written the book, I don't know if, if I could have lived with myself. We love you more. Uh, thank you. That's okay. <laughs> I didn't write it for your love or anybody's love. I wrote it just for the love of a country and the love of my people. And um, and I think that I think that comes. I hope that comes across in the book. I well, do. what what I found moving was that your love for America as well. It opens uh, with my love for America. Yeah, it's full of love. How but can I not, uh, you know, how can I not have love? Look, it's, it's, it's a really poignant thing. I mean, you got two best friends that are really divided. And sometimes I ask myself, will we ever have, you know, the, the mother of all divisions where you have really a, uh, a conflict of interest that's severe and strategic between America and Israel? So no matter how special the relationship is, uh, do you ever foresee something that really threatens the relationship? Well, right now, I, I, I will always say and stay to the day that bipartisan support for Israel is a paramount strategic interest of Israel, that we should never become the monopoly of one party. That, you know, chas, a shalom. But right now, we're at a juncture where that maintaining that bipartisan support is very difficult. We have to choose between a bad deal with Iran that threatens our existence and bipartisan support, which is essential for our security. It's a very terrible choice. A terrible choice. Right. And you also and mention in the book mm -hmm. that the stakes are not as high for America. So here's a, an example. It's a big a, example. Of a major you know, it's strategic What is interesting, David, I, I've, I've had a number of these conversations, public conversations, and there's one question that nobody ever asked me. So maybe you're going to ask me, and I don't want to see. I get to ask a few questions, too. There are two chapters here about the Pollard case. Because I'm the last Israeli official, to my knowledge, who visited Pollard in prison. You don't want to do this. But why I mention Pollard now um, is because it goes to the heart of the question of dual loyalty. And this book, I take a different approach. I'm proud of my dual loyalty. <laughs> I come out right out front and say, I have I dual loyalty. Yeah. And I've made a decision about which loyalty is going to take precedence in terms of my, you know, my political loyalty, my strategic loyalty, my uh, my nationality, I had to give up my American citizenship to do what I did, and that's how the book opens with me giving up my American citizenship and how painful that is to me. But it's not going to make me less American when I don't. I'm not going I'm I'm to give up my love of football. I, you know, I'm going you know, to give up my love of American culture, American ideas. You can't take that away from me. You can't. I'm part of me. It's essential. But I, I, it's a recurring theme is dual loyalty. How do we be Americans and Jews and, and, and be part of the Jewish people and love Israel and serve Israel? Pollard is the flip side of that argument, and all the fear surrounding Pollard. It's interesting, when I appear before, I, I don't know if everyone's Jewish here, but if you're in front of mostly Jewish audiences, they don't want to talk about Pollard, because it's just too sensitive. And I, again, made a decision that I was going to talk about Pollard in the deepest, again, most agonized way, because it, um, it was an experience that left me emotionally and physically broken. And... Um, I do hope, I do hope that he can be released and come back to Israel, that's all. Yeah, what, uh, yeah. what I found disappointing is how, you know, at some point you mentioned it in the book, how Pollard became like a bargaining chip when they were talking about the p potential expansion of the freeze. I want to push back a little bit on one thing you said about people are afraid to talk about Pollard. That might have been true 10 years ago, but the sentence has gone on for so long that he's gotten a lot more mainstream support in the past few years. But I, I do, uh, uh, I want to ask a question on Iran. One of the things you've said a number of times is that you pushed for early publishing of the book so that it would have some influence on what's going on now with Iran. It's incredible that we're meeting tonight, a day that is right in the heart, down to the wire, and they're talking about extending it for a few days, which they are doing. Uh, do you think the book is helping from what you're seeing? Is it? I think the book is, I, my, I, I, my hope is people actually read the book, not read what people have alleged it's in the book or imputed to me, um, and that it will, dis it will start this discussion. Because a cardinal part of the, of the whole discussion around Iran relates to trust. And the president has asked over the course of the last five and a half years, has asked something quite extraordinary from, from Israelis. He's saying, trust me, I've got your back. Um, I'm not bluffing. These are quotes. All options are on the table. He's basically saying, trust me with the lives of your children and grandchildren. 
Nothing, nothing less. And so a record of what happened to that trust and how it was eroded becomes absolutely germane to the debate around you know, Iran. There was an interesting piece by Michael Doran this morning in Mosaic where he says, you know, Michael should have just come out and said, I got taken. That Me? <laughs> yeah. Like Israel got taken, BB got taken, you got taken. Because if you look at the book, you so really... He's a former student of mine. I, I should have failed the guy. Right. Right. <laughs> but I like, he's brilliant. Did you get taken in sure. a way? But well, in a way, you're saying it in a very polite way yeah. that uh, the issue of trust, because, you know, for so many years, Obama was saying, I've got your back. I'm not bluffing. And then you find out at the end of the book that, well, maybe he was bluffing. How did you take that personally? I didn't take it so bad personally because we had our intelligence estimates of what the United States was doing and what, what it wasn't going to do. And at a certain point, uh, I talk about how, it, from our perspective, the United, the, government seemed, the United States government seemed to be more concerned about the possibility of an Israeli preemptive strike than it was about the Iranian nuclear program. Correct, correct. And, um, and that's certainly the, what we felt. If you so were we, these, these, these weren't surprises. And, and also, as a sovereign Jewish state, which has the duty and the right to defend itself and the capability to defend it. We don't have the capabilities of the United States, but we have the capabilities. Then we don't outsource our fundamental security to anybody, even somebody we very much trust. That's and an that was a decision line. made by Levi Eshkol in 1967. It was a decision made by Ben Gurion in 1948. Had to make a very similar decision when the United States said, wait a minute, trust us, we'll have diplomacy. They didn't say that, we said that. You, you, all right. And it's not as if Israel hasn't been at this juncture before. We have not come back from 2,000 years of exile to forge this state in the most inhospitable area of the world in order to forfeit our right to defend ourselves. That's all. Now, if you were Obama, mm -hmm. if you were Obama relative to Iran, what would you do? can't say that because Obama has a certain world view about Iran. But if it was you, if you were now President of the United States and you were in charge of the negotiations with the I, P plus I, I would say what would you do? When I made a statement going back and again, I keep on going back to 2009, it's you know, the year of creation. Um, when I say that the window for diplomacy will not remain indefinitely open, I got to stick by that. And I got to close the window. He made a statement yesterday. The president said, uh, I'm willing, I, I may walk away from this, from this deal. It's not a good deal. Do the Iranians believe him? Do they have, do they have empirical basis for believing him? Because this has been said again and again, and they always come back. So if I, I, I'm not, I had a deal with it. Uh, one of the challenges in the book was the, the deal with the fact that I, I tend to be rather, I come across as rather prescient and clairvoyant. You know? <laughs> and it, Cause, but I don't think it's rocket science. I, I have been saying for the last couple of months, if not uh, longer, that the Iranians wouldn't sign on June 30th, even though I thought the, the book should come out now, because who knows, they, they could. Why? Because they have internalized that the longer they negotiate, the more concessions they get. Whereas it should be just the opposite. The longer they dither, the fewer centrifuges they should get. All right. right? It's just the opposite. No. And, um, how do, you, how do you answer, Michael? Hey, let's say you do walk away now. Can't they just walk over the finish line and complete the bomb? Well, then you have to have a credible military threat. That's mm, what that okay. is. What's the problem with the credible military threat? The credible military threat is a paradox. The more credible it is, the lesser the chance you'll have to use it. The more the Iranians believe it, by the way. By the way, if you have to use it, the earlier you use it, it's, it's less dangerous than later you have to use it. Because once the Iranian program goes underground, you've got a problem. You've got a carpet, bab, you've got a carpet bomb all of Iran. Right now, they're very exposed on, on, in, the, in the enrichment process. Um, but the Iranian leadership, they know they're paying a very high price for their nuclear program, you know, tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars. But they believe that at the end of the day, they're going to have the thing. They have not realized, because there's no credible military threat, that at the end of the day, they're not going to get the thing, and that they're paying all this money for naught. Because if they think they're going to get a bomb, they're not because they're going to get bombed. Right? And so, again, try to see it through Iranian eyes. Uh, Ehud Barak, I had, a, I had the pleasure uh, and often the honor of working with Ehud Barak as defense minister. And thank you. Um, no, because I, 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 he's one of the few people, there's no word for positive reinforcement in Hebrew, so we use a, a Yiddish word, we use firgun. 
And I always say that uh, leaving Ben Gurion Airport, there's a big sign with the word Firgun written with a big red line through it and a warning to people leaving the airport, warning you are entering a Firgun free zone. <laughs> Edward Barak knew how to give me Fergun. He was, he was very supportive of me. But Edward Barak would always say in meetings with American officials, and I'm not going to imitate his accent, he has a very heavy accent. He says, the Iranians, they don't play checkers, they play chess. And they play multi-tiered chess. They're very smart. Well, you know, if I can and make one comment about the book, the book is full of delicious anecdotes, like Michael just said, including one moment when his wife Sally, they have a heart-to-heart, -heart He's thinking about putting his hat in the ring to be ambassador, a lifelong dream. And then they go through all the possible negatives and the conflicts, blah, blah, blah. And then she looks at you and says, are you sure you want to expose yourself to all that? <laughs> well, Good. what's there the answer, again. Michael? You are certainly exposed. I'm exposed. Looking back, are you happy you did it? I will be happy when I'm back in my home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have zero regrets here. Um, I. My whole life, David, and I think you know this, has been about service. Um, the easiest thing would have been to go back to Israel, um, make some money, take a vacation. Um, and I felt I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. You know, when I was writing the book, and, and then I went into politics. You really got to have your head examined. Um, you know, when I first Knesset. met you, you were a scholar. I met you at Shalem 10 some yeah. years ago. And Those were the days. And I had this vision of you, you know, spending hundreds and hundreds of hours alone with boxes of archives going through because you were writing these very, very, you know, heavy books. And then all of a sudden when you got nominated uh, ambassador, I'm saying his whole life is going to change. Here you go from being a scholar who spends hundreds of hours with archives to being a completely open, exposed diplomat Target. who got to <laughs> buy a lot of suits yeah. and just be public 24-7. How was that from a personal standpoint? Um, it's something I, I deal with, um, and it's one of the more difficult trans transformations. I had some dry runs. I, I, I very frequently during my life went from being a civilian to a soldier. And being an ambassador, you put on a, you put on a uniform. It's not green, it's kind of blue. Uh, but it's a uniform, and you give up your ideas in favor of positions, and they're not your positions, they're the positions of a government. Uh, and by the way, that's true of people across the aisle on the United States side. We'd be at 2 o'clock in the morning in the White House screaming at each other. Um, but in many ways, I had more in common with the person screaming at me across the table than I had with people outside the White House. Because they made the same decision. They gave up their sleep, they gave up their vacation, in most cases they gave up very handsome incomes to put on a uniform and serve their country. And I, whenever I meet young people, there must be some young people out there, um, I always say if you're looking, if you want a life that is very tough life, that has no vacations, that you're going to kiss your family goodbye, but it's going to be inestimably war war rewarding, think about a life of service. If you stay and serve the United States, any country, it's service, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, even on the spiritual level, to serve is, is, is a great, is a great, great, it's schut. It's the only word for it, it's schut. Now, sometimes when you schut is, is a great privilege. Um, sometimes that privilege involves pain. Sometimes it involves shame. Um, one of the ways I've been able to weather the last two weeks is because I've been through all this before. <laughs> I've had people screaming at me and using some very spicy language. I've been grilled in the national media. I have a section where I talk about my involvement with the 60 Minutes attempt to defame the state of Israel as an, as an anti-Christian country. Um, tough stuff. You're going to read how, just how tough it was to be an ambassador. It's, it's a good dry run for these two weeks. Um, Do you feel that there's a concerted attack against you? I noticed in your interview with Martin Indyk, your uh, debate with Martin Indyk the other day on television, mm -hmm. you quoted him when he was using a phrase like you're putting oil on the fire. Yeah, it's he messaging. Said, yeah. They're very good at messaging. Messaging, right. And I said he'd been briefed. He said he wasn't briefed. And I said, of course you've been briefed. You didn't choose those words randomly. I encountered these words uh, when, when, when Dan Shapiro, the ambassador, first called me, he used that term. It's, 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 it's not by accident. Your thin so, has gotten thicker? Your hmm? skin has gotten thicker? I don't think I have skin anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, what good. is it? I, um, I was interviewed. There's a wonderful journalist in Israel named Yoaz Hendel who is uh, a favorite of, of so many people, a former commander in the Navy SEALs. And he, I, he was interviewing me in Hebrew the other day, and he says, you know, Michael, you sound a lot like Don Quixote. 
And I broke out laughing because uh, in my the autobiographical part of the book, I talk about playing Don Quixote in Man of La Mancha in my high school play. And I ask myself all the time, have I ever gotten out of that role? <laughs> now, mind you, our windmills are a little bit more serious. But when, um, yeah. And it's a criticism I have of myself. Maybe I, you know, maybe I have this Don Quixote complex, perhaps. Um, but when you're a scholar, you search for the truth at all times, right? And all of a sudden, you're a diplomat. There's a part in your book where you quote a British uh, writer who says, when I'm a diplomat, I lie for my country. Yeah, it's Henry, what, 17th century English diplomat. It says, a, a, a diplomat, a, an ambassador is a man of virtue who is sent abroad to lie for his country. True. And I correct him. I said, he's wrong. An ambassador is a man of virtue who is sent abroad to lie for two, two countries. Two countries. And, um, and, that and must then be I talk about the deep physical and emotional price I paid to always come out with the same message. There's no daylight. Because I was so terrified of the ramifications of daylight. Because our enemies are going to hear that and they're going to exploit it. Believe me, they're going to exploit it. They exploited it last summer. You don't think Hezbollah watched last summer while our airport was closed? I guarantee you the next war, there'll be thousands of rockets fired at that airport. Guarantee you. They're watching. That's daylight. Well, you distinguish between diplomatic daylight and security daylight because you give a lot of credit to President Obama for the tremendous help in terms of security uh, cooperation and so forth. But you said something here that I had not read anywhere else. You distinguish between the two types, the security daylight and then the uh, diplomatic daylight. And when it comes to the enemy, they don't distinguish between the two. Well, that they, this was a policy decision. Um, I don't know what level, uh, you know, I don't know what the actual uh, policy-making process was, but clearly the president said that I'm going to put daylight between Israel and the United States on the diplomatic process. Remember, it, it, when, there's, when there's no daylight, the Israelis sit on the side and do nothing. But to counterbalance it, he decided to make far less daylight on security. And we're going to upgrade our support for Iron Dome, other systems. We're going to make the intelligence relationship even more intimate, as if one would compensate the other. And it becomes a messaging. You know, we, have, we, we the administration, has, have presided over the closest security cooperation that Israel's ever known. And it gave United his States. defenders and a talking point. Hmm? It gave his defenders. All the time. All, the, especially toward the American Jewish point. community. Right. It was particularly directed at American Jews, but uh, it, beyond a talking point. If you talk to anybody high up in the Israeli intelligence or security establishment, they'll tell you. It's ne we've never had it so good. And so you had. This was supposed to counterbalance one or the other. The problem is we are in the Middle East and it doesn't work. Because in the Middle East, they don't distinguish between diplomatic and security daylight. They just see daylight. And we have a very harsh sun in the Middle East. And it's blinding. And, uh, and clearly, his, Hamas last summer didn't distinguish between the two daylights. I thought that was one of the best insights in the book. We're going to open it up. Questions? Anybody? Here, yes, right here. Oh, he's got a big voice. Go ahead. Yeah. Hang on. The S-300, the Russian system. I don't know. I, I will not try to minimize the, the, the uh, challenges posed by the S-300's anti-aircraft system. It's a very advanced system. But, um, you know, we're pretty smart people. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Go ahead. Welcome. Thank you very much for uh, coming out to see us tonight. Um, talking about Kishkas, how, uh, what, what emotional effect uh, did it have when uh, for example, you went out to Irvine University uh, a bunch of years ago, uh, and you had to encounter that crowd there. Um, and here in the United States, when you have 75% of Jews voting for uh, uh, Obama, uh, does that give the president kind of support that he can, that he has the Jewish support that uh, uh, allows him to uh, uh, put daylight between 
uh, us and Israel, United States and Israel? Well, I, I think we're asking some of the same questions again. You know, do American Jews not care about Israel? And I, 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 gave, my, I, I, I gave my family as Exhibit A uh, as a good example. They care passionately about Israel, but they care about other things. And they care about issues that are closer to Obama's agenda than, say, to a Republican agenda. It's not just about Obama. It's about the Democratic Party. They're Democrats. Um, so my answer to you is obvious. It, 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 it's, it's an empirical yes, because there has been daylight. And the president, the Democratic Party has paid a certain price in Jewish vote. It went from 78% in 2008 to 70%. And sometimes I've seen uh, uh, figures as low as in the 50s now. But still, the majority of American, if, if, if there were to be, if he were to go for a third term, I think he'd win the majority of American Jewish votes handily. Is this one of the greatest divides, Michael, between America and Israel, the Jewish communities, when you see how Obama is perceived in Israel relative to how Obama is perceived in America? I mean, the numbers are just dramatic. Well, the most dramatic drop was after the Cairo speech. He had a quite high uh, support in Israel when he was first elected. There was a lot of, a lot of uh, excitement. The Cairo speech, the support for uh, the popularity support, Israelis don't vote, uh, plummeted to 4% probably the lowest level ever of a president. And that was, that was shocking, and I, I felt the uh, reverberations of that because I got some anger from that from American, uh, American Jewish members of Congress um, who were angry about it um, and thought we hadn't done enough to improve the president's image. This woman has a... I'll repeat it if you want. Yeah. Do you believe that Obama is a feather in his cap? He's going to do everything he sign. thinks it is. He said it. Yeah, regardless of, of the consequences. We're hemorrhaging our crowd here. What did we say? Right. <laughs> but uh, what? my observation is since Obama came to power and so publicly lashed at Israel that anti-Semitism around the world have risen tremendously. A lot of Muslims in Europe feel free because if the President of the United States is lashing at Israel, why shouldn't we? It, uh, you're, you're touching, talk about us talking a sensitive nerve. Um, and I didn't shy away from this one either. Listen, when the administration's uh, messaging is that if Israel doesn't agree to a two-state solution, we will become isolated, we will become, um, we will be sanctioned, we will become an apartheid state. We hear that in Israel as a threat. And it's interesting, uh, you mentioned Jeff Goldberg. Jeff Goldberg, whom I quote, went on CNN one time and said, hey, that sounds like a threat. Sort of like saying, nice Jewish state you have here. It would be a pity if something were to happen to it. That kind of threat. That's the way we heard it. Um, my recommendation to uh, the administration was always don't do that because Israelis make concessions when, we, when, we, when we're not threatened. I think it's counterproductive. The whole approach was counterproductive. John Kerry would do this all the time, every week. Apartheid state, sanctions, Try love. That was what? your line. My line was try, try love. love. We respond to love. Imagine that, human beings responding to love and uh, not to threats. And um, it, it, unquestioned, and the, I think the, the administration knows it doesn't have the ability to cut aid to Israel. Congress is not going to cut aid. Popularity, Israel's popularity among the American public is close to an all time high, not an all time low. What you have is Europe and particularly Western Europe. And, I, and in my position in Knesset, I meet with a lot of European delegations and leaders, and I always have the same line to them, same line to them. Right now, you are America's stick. Don't you ever get sick of being America's stick? But you are. And why don't you play a more productive role? Why don't you play a more nuanced and balanced role? Here's your opportunity. There's a diplomatic vacuum in the Middle East. And it's, um, one sees the symbiotic relationship between the threats from Washington and the actual movements to boycott in Europe. Go ahead. Um, in November, November 2016, what are the odds that uh, Obama will recognize a Palestinian state? It's not recognizing a Palestinian state. It has to do with the French initiative or New Zealand initiative in the Security Council whether the United States would veto it, whether the United States would abstain on it, perhaps even support it. it a lot of it has to do with the, uh, the wording of the resolution. There are certain red lines. One of those red lines, for example, would be a timetable for Israeli withdrawal. I think the administration would not stand by, would not allow that to happen. It also depends on us. 
And um, I want to put my cards on the table. I, I, I am not a member of the Prime Minister's party. I'm not a Likudnik. I represent a party which is a centrist party, though we're in the government. I have had the honor of being the architect of our party's uh, diplomatic platform. We support the notion of a two-state solution. If you ask me if you think it's going to happen tomorrow, I don't think so. Um, do I think if it even happened, would that Palestinian state be able to sustain itself? It would not. Okay, last summer, um, <laughs> Hamas tried to kill Mahmoud Abbas. The only reason he's still alive is because of the IDF. He wants the IDF to withdraw. All right. Um, they'll be taken over by Hamas at best, if ISIS, if not worse, and very quickly. But our position should be, we're at the table. Even though the chair is empty across from us, we're at the table. And I think we should go back to an understanding that existed between Eric Sharon and George Bush in 2004, the, George, the, the bush Sharon Accord, which said that we recognize, we, the United States, recognize that there will be areas of Jewish Jerusalem beyond the 49 armistice line and the major settlement blocks of the West Bank, in which 85% of the settlers live in less than 2% of Judea and Samaria, that those areas will always be part of the Jewish state in the event of the creation of a Palestinian state. We know this, I published this in the Wall Street Journal about three months ago, it was called the two-state situation. I believe that if Israel to adopt that policy, we could defend ourselves to a far greater degree against the possibility of danger of boycotts and sanctions from Europe, and I believe that we could get onto a different footing, maybe not with everybody in this administration, but certainly with the administration that will come into the White House in 2016. Well, there is an opening in the foreign ministry, Michael. You're aware <laughs> of that opening? Yeah. Okay. The French are um, talking in the, you know, in the Security Council um, basically about uh, removing from Israel the right to negotiate and treating Israel like a child and gathering together in the Security Council and dictating to Israel a settlement with the Palestinians and I'm very concerned about that other shoe dropping in the future. Um, we hear warning after warning after warning that uh, President Obama is not going to veto. Please comment. I don't know. I'll be very honest with you. And I haven't known for close to a year now. Um, I began to signal my, my, my lack of, of, of confidence in this uh, last summer. Um, many Israelis looked at me and said, no, no, no. Now, the president himself has come out and said he's not sure how he's going to vote on this. So I don't have to gainsay what he says. I don't know. And, and, and I will say that um, it is, is a source of concern. I, don't ask me to explain French diplomacy. I, I think that uh, often it's an oxymoron. They get money from Qatar. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of money involved. Qatar, and there's lots of everything involved. Qatar's they do putting just, a lot of money DAFCA. into the They do DAFCA to the United right. States. You know, every United States, yeah, they're right. going to do DAFCA. They also sense a vacuum. Diplomacy, like outer space, hates a vacuum. And if America's not the leadership there, the French will go in. They happen in Libya. And, um, but I think this is what Rob Eshman was saying, that right. the, the being on the defensive and not sort of bringing ideas, exactly I like what ideas. you were saying. Question like the two-state situation, establishing that you're not going to build outside of those settlement blocks. Mm. That kind of stuff, I think, we feel is missing a sense of taking the initiative. Okay, but it, it was yeah. certainly in the book. Yeah, it <laughs> I was. write about the two-state situation in the book. It's there. It was. Um, I'm sorry if somebody missed it. But um, I want to get just to the point here, is that understand why, see the big picture in the French initiative. What's the big picture in the French initiative? If they pass a resolution which has a Security Council imprimatur on it, for a peace plan that will basically supplant Resolution 242, and we violate it. You know what Mahmoud Abbas is going to do? He's going to take that to the International Criminal Court, and he's going to say not only is Israel a war criminal for illegally occupying a member state of the UN, but it's also violating a Security Council resolution. And he's going to use that violation not to bring about a better two-state solution. He's going to bring it about, use it to bring about our dissolution. That is a strategic threat. Hamas threatens us with rockets as a tactical threat. The real strategic threat is what's going to happen in the ICC. And that any Israeli security official will tell you. And uh, that is the big picture. It's not just about a Security Council resolution. It's about sanctions. It's about delegitimization. Okay, a couple more. Go ahead. I'm sorry, there's somebody up there. Go ahead. Can we get a little colder in here? Right. <laughs> it is freezing. Is it just me? I got a suit on. 
What? I think they try to freeze us out. I think we're losing people because it's cold. What? Uh, two questions. Number one, look, look into your crystal ball. What do you think is going to happen with negotiations if there are any negotiations that are finalized with Iran? The second thing is, I'm curious, you're in the Knesset. What is Israel thinking about what's happening in Syria? What are their thoughts? Hmm. Um, I, I can't predict what's going to happen in the, in the Iranian negotiations. I always say that I'm, a, I'm an historian by training. I have enough problems predicting the past. Um, <laughs> I do think the Iranians are going to drag it out, drag it out. Um, they may make a conclusion that they're getting so many benefits just from the negotiated process that they don't have to sign anything. Keep in mind, they've gone, they've gone from becoming part of the problem to part of the solution. They may feel that the sanctions are going to begin to unravel. They already have their nuclear program legitimized. They already have their regional primacy legitimized. All right. And they're, the men, remember, remember Erwin Barak, multi-tiered chess. At the same time that they're having a nuclear program, they're moving in Yemen, they're moving in Iraq. They're now part of the solution, they got legitimacy. So they may conclude that, hey, we're getting enough out of, just out of the negotiations, we don't have to sign anything, perhaps. Uh, I suggest that to you, so I don't know. As for Syria, um, Israel's long-standing position was that we preferred just about anybody to Bashar al-Assad, because he was the strategic a keystone in an arc that extended from Tehran to Beirut. He collapsed, both sides of the arc would collapse. It would be not much of a threat. This does not mean that the enemy of the enemy is my enemy, is my friend. In the middle, in the least, you can have the enemy of my enemy is my enemy. And that's what you have in Syria. The enemy of Bashar al-Assad is ISAD, ISIS, and Jabhal al-Nusra, and all these other terrible al-Qaeda-like organizations who are also our enemy. And for our purposes, it's very good that our enemies are shooting at our enemies. Um, we wish they would do a better job against Hezbollah. Okay, one more. Uh, here, may I well, say something? I'm trying to close. Um, I'm, this is Dr. Uh, Mr. Sousa. I'm, I'm curious about something. Uh, we were discussing how the major a great majority of the American Jews are not as supportive uh, of the Israeli. Uh, situation and all. Uh, I always question whether the media causes a lot of this because they air all the dirty laundry and there's so much anti-Semitism in the world right now, it's just going to go rampant. And it's very, that part is very disturbing to me. I, you know, I like something that, since you call that my name, I like something that Leon Wiesetier said. He said, Jews in America feel really, really safe. And I think that gets uh, reflected in many ways. I think the whole Tikkun Olam movement is a reflection of how secure we feel in America. And I think a lot of the chutzpah you see in terms of how so many Jews criticize Israel comes from that sense of safety. You feel safe and it, it, it looks good. It's, it's seen in the Jewish light tough love, self-criticism is a great Jewish value. Um, so I, I hear it all the time. So I'm not as hard on the, uh, the, the Jewish critics, uh, even among journalism, as, as, as Michael said, maybe because I live with Rob Eshman all day long and I love the guy. <laughs> so, um, but it's gonna, it, it is what it is. And I think the, 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 the real um, poignant part of the book is the ending of the book when Michael talks about repairing. Uh, and how do we move forward to sort of keep the two communities, the American Jews and the uh, Israeli Jews, somehow connected because there are some real differences and one of them is American Jews cannot smell Israel. You know, Michael was going into the uh, bomb shelters uh, when he was writing the book. My daughters were in bomb shelters last summer. I go to Israel twice a year and I smell Israel. And when you don't smell Israel, it's really easy to sit here in America and just say, well, let's give up the West Bank and blah, blah, blah. Israel becomes a theoretical idea. And I think that's, that's a really big division. And at, at the same token, Israelis don't understand the value that uh, Americans put on pluralism and so forth. So there are some genuine differences, and I hope that uh, programs like Birthright and so forth will help bridge them. I have the oh, the lady in green. Who, the lady with the mic. Okay. 
Um, I was just wondering, you're, you're probably familiar with J Street, and it's quite- No, never heard of no. it. No. <laughs> <laughs> and it's quite yeah. different than APAC, and all my kids are, they say, go, you know, listen to what J Street has to say, and it's, and they're much more for it than they are for APAC. So I'm just wondering if you disagree completely with uh, what uh, J Street's policies are. Well, I, I, Lisa, I had a lot of interaction with J Street, and I have no illusions about J Street. Um, I think that J Street um, represents a challenge for Israel. Uh, I think it also represents an, an opportunity for Israel. What does it mean? J Street defines itself as a pro-Israel organization. As ambassador, I had to take J Street on its words, but I would always say that while Israel has an, it has an interest in having a biggest as possible, biggest possible tent of pro-Israel organizations, even tents have flaps and pegs. And the flap of that tent is Israel has a right to exist as a sovereign Jewish state. Israel has a right to defend itself. Israel has a democratic system, which is one of our greatest accomplishments. Let's respect what the people's interests are in Israel, the way the choices they make at the ballot box. That, that's in the tent. By the way, I, feel, I see a, a, a signal lack of respect for Israeli choices at the, ba at, at the, at, at, at the ballot box, um, and lack of respect for our democratic system. But still, that tent. So sometimes J Street goes in that tent, sometimes out of it, especially on the Iranian issue, leading a huge campaign in favor of this deal. Now, this is a deal. They are going against the overwhelming majority of Israelis on this. This is not a matter of left, right, up, down. The head of the opposition in Israel, Yitzhak Herzog, came out less early this week and said, there's no difference between me and Netanyahu on the, on the Iranian thing, but there's a big difference with J Street. They seem to think it's good for us. So that, there's that problem. But as you said, kids are drawn to J Street. And for many of these Jewish kids on campuses, J Street is the last step, uh, last stop before they're out of the tent. It's not a way into the tent, it's a way out. They join JVP or some you know, horrible anti-Zionist organization. I have, a, I have a more Sephardic take on J Street, is I don't feel the goosebumps. They keep telling me that they love Israel, and they love Israel, and they support Israel, and I'm telling them, well, why don't you play the Atikva at your uh, conventions? I just don't feel your love. And I say I, to them all the time, why don't you, their, their, their motto, their logo, is a green arrow pointed upward. I said, there's nothing about your logo, and I met with their board several times. I said, change your logo, convince me. Put the color blue in your logo. Put it in his, put a Star of David in your logo. You got a green arrow. I, I, I said, to him, hey, green's the color of Hamas. What are you doing here? You know, really. Um, I, don't, I don't get that. So it, I think it's very important that we, the state of Israel, reach out to the youth of J Street. It is important. We keep, we keep them engaged. But we also have to let them know that there are tents with flaps and pegs. And you can be out of it, too. And Michael, you've been a great representative of that tent and we're really grateful that you were you, you took the time and for everything you do for the jewish people in israel Thank you, David. Thank you, David. on behalf of the museum of tolerance and the wiesenthal center thank you very much again mr oren dr oren for your remarks thank you david for moderating i'm going to invite you gentlemen to walk this way please um, I invite the audience to leave through the right exit, which will take you to the books uh, selling and signing. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm shifting up there.